Well, good evening. I am uh, Robert Shapiro, the Interim Dean of Emory Law School, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening to this banner night in the life of the law school. At Emory, we pride ourselves on the close relationship among our students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and we celebrate that relationship tonight. Every year, we have the opportunity to recognize three out of our more than 10,000 alumni and to salute them for their great achievements in law, in their careers, and in life. The award winners will join the small and prestigious group uh, who are honored on our fifth floor corridor. Their photographs will be there for all time, and their portraits and their stories are there as the faculty and students. We go back and forth through that corridor every day. We look at the photographs, and we're inspired by the stories. They challenge us to remember how important law is and to try to make sure that our lives in the law have as great an impact as that of our award winners. Now, the alumni of Emory Law are indeed a remarkable group of men and women. I've met many over the past 15 years that I've been here, and their stories never fail to inspire me. They make me very proud to be a lawyer, and especially to be an Emory lawyer. Now, in that sense, our award winners are really exemplars. They are distinguished in their own right, but they're really representative of our extraordinary alumni body. Now, the awards will be presented this evening by Della Wells, the president of the Emory Law Alumni Board. Della herself is a wonderful exemplar of the highest traditions of the legal profession. She's a partner in Alston and Byrd, where she specializes in a variety of finance matters. She earned her JD with distinction from Emory Law School. She is a member of the National Association of Bond Lawyers and has received extraordinary professional recognition from a variety of sources, including being noted in Chambers USA, America's Leading Lawyers for Business, The Best Lawyers in America, and Super Lawyers Magazine. In addition to her exploits in the legal field itself, Della has been a wonderful citizen of Atlanta and of the world. To draw on her considerable business expertise and sound judgment, the rector of All Saints Episcopal Church asked her to serve as senior warden of the vestry, which is the governing body of the church. It's not a small job, but she still manages to make her voice heard as, as rector and warden and in the alto section of the choir. Della's work also extends around the world. Uh, she has been to Africa uh, and elsewhere, uh, pursuing the wonderful work of these organizations. Now, at Emory Law, in addition to presiding over the alumni board, uh, Della also serves on the Dean's Advisory Board. She mentors students, and she does so much more. We're so grateful for the countless hours that she devotes to Emory. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to President Wells. Please join me in welcoming her. I thank Dean Shapiro for his, for his kindness in, uh, in his introductions, and uh, I thought I was here to preside over the honors and not to be recognized at all. Apologize for all that. Um, good evening, and welcome to the Emory Law School 2011 Distinguished Alumni Awards. As an alumna from the class of 1986 and president of the Law School Alumni Board, it's my privilege to present the school's highest alumni award to this evening's recipients. Tonight we recognize three alumni of Emory Law who reflect positively on our law school and on our community. They are leaders in private practice, pioneers in the public sector, and champions of community service. These individuals share the academic rigor, the cherished traditions, and the sense of common purpose that has shaped their careers and unites them as role models for our current students and our greater community. This year's recipients join a select group of only 102 other graduates who have been honored with the Distinguished Alumni Award since it was first presented in 1985. Tonight, as we induct our newest members, we will present our honorees a framed award that not only displays the winner's image, but also, and most importantly, memorializes the accomplishments and values that earned them a spot in this exclusive society. It is most appropriate that their awards will be displayed on the fifth floor in the Distinguished Alumni Hall 
of honor on as I know you all probably remember walking by that. I remember it keenly as a student, looking at those pictures and aspiring and wondering how I would fit into that, if ever. Our current students walk past these images every day. They will forever be reminded that each new generation of Emory Law alumni has the opportunity to build on the accomplishments of those who came before us. I've performed a lot of duties as an Emory Law alumna in the now 25 years since I've graduated. That's a tough number for me. Presiding over this ceremony is one of the highlights as we celebrate the accomplishments of my fellow alumni. Now I'm honored to begin the presentation of the 2011 Distinguished Alumni Awards. Dean Shapiro, would you please join me on the stage? And I'd like to recognize our first recipient, Aaron Bushbaum, of the class of 1954. I also ask that Mr. Bushbaum and Mr. Bushbaum Herbert, his son, join us on the stage. I will now read the inscription on the award. After earning his degree at Emory Law in 1954, Aaron L. Bushbaum returned to his hometown of Savannah to practice law and fight against discrimination. He was a member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and volunteer attorney for the American Civil Liberties Associate Union at a time when belonging to those institutions, especially in the Deep South, could exact a personal and professional cost. Bushbaum was an officer of the National Jewish Community Relations Advisory Council, active in the Anti-Defamation League, and championed human and civil rights whenever possible. In 1967, he was the first attorney to challenge racial discrimination in Georgia grand and petty jury selections in a case that led to the desegregation of juries in the state. He was president of Savannah Legal Aid and Georgia Legal Services, where he oversaw a broad expansion of the program, which provides legal services to the indigent. In the 1960s, he successfully challenged legal practices used to jail civil rights demonstrators in Savannah. He was instrumental in desegregating the Savannah Bar Association, and in 1980, he resigned from the organization over its practice of holding functions at private clubs with discriminatory membership policies. He later rejoined after the group ended the practice. He retired from active legal practice in 2006. In 2011, the Economic Opportunity Authority for Savannah Ch Chatham County Area, Inc bestowed its highest honor by naming its new Head Start building after Bushbaum in recognition of 40 years of exemplary service as leader of the EOA's legal team. He served Emory Law on the Law School Council and assisted with barrister level and class gift fundraising. He and his wife have supported the Emory Public Interest Committee and the Law School Fund for Excellence since 1975. It is our honor to present to you, Aaron, the 2011 Distinguished Alumni Award. I'd like to introduce Herbert Bushbaum, who will make remarks on behalf of his father. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wells, Dean Shapiro, and everyone who came here tonight to uh, honor my dad and the other distinguished alumni. Uh, this is an important and meaningful honor for my father, who practiced law for more than 50 years. He now has Alzheimer's, so unfortunately doesn't remember most of it, or much of it. Uh, he grew up in Savannah in the 1930s, a uh, time and place where he was confronted with deep, widespread poverty, and if you happen to be black, vile degradation heaped on top of that. 
he witnessed through the eyes of a child injustices and indignities that turned his stomach and which he never forgot. Uh, fighting injustice and equality became his passion. As a lawyer, he never stopped working to oppose them. Um, this was not his job. The uh, NAACP did not have a staff attorney in Savannah, nor did the ACLU or at the time Georgia Legal Services. Uh, the meat and potatoes of his practice was that, like that of a lot of other small town lawyers, uh, hodgepodge of business law, some criminal cases, private disputes, helping people out of a jam, a bit of this and that. Uh, the accomplishments that he's being honored for tonight and many others that he's known for in Savannah, he did on the side and pro bono. Um, I think there's a message there for um, young lawyers and, uh, and uh, law students, which is that um, you don't have to be a public service lawyer to do public service. Uh, that as you're clawing your way to the top of the partnership ladder, you can, if you choose, devote some time to work for equal, equal justice for all. Uh, which is a concept that, if it's still to mean anything, uh, requires the work of dedicated lawyers. To choose that path requires commitment and a certain amount of courage. To say that defending civil rights protectors in Savannah in the 60s was unpopular doesn't tell half the story. Uh, a lot of folks were quite upset by the idea, violently so. There was name-calling, threats, uh, but this to me was the definition of being willing to stand up for what's right and what you believe in. This kind of commitment came naturally to my dad. Uh, once he was convinced something was right, as anyone in our family will tell you, he was not likely to back down. Um, in the 60s, as he was taking on some rather controversial cases, his mother was worried uh, that he could be in personal danger and that uh, his work could actually destroy his legal practice. But she never tried to talk him out of it because she knew that she couldn't. Um, Call it stubbornness, call it dedication. It was an essential quality for someone uh, willing to stick his neck out to be, in many cases, the only lawyer uh, willing to take these cases, uh, and certainly the only white one, um, to challenge injustices in Savannah, a city that has always taken pride in doing things the way that they've always been done. Um, what, I, what I would like to know is, is why um, a lot of people were offended by the same things my dad saw uh, but doing something about them was another story. Uh, unfortunately, my dad is no longer in a position to answer that question, but I recently found a video of an interview he gave about 10 years ago, and he gave at least part of the answer. Uh, he said, I grew up in a large, loving, nurturing family, and my family always had feelings for people. Whatever I am, I'm a product of that family, that community. Uh, he was also a product of this community, Emory Law. Um, he doesn't remember a lot about his career these days, uh, but he does uh, remember his time here six decades ago uh, this fall. Uh, a few weeks ago, Dean Shapiro was passing through Savannah, and we had dinner together, and my dad mentioned that uh, he went to law school here, and that he had done well, and that it meant a lot to him. Uh, he was always very proud of his time here. Uh, we are grateful to be here with him tonight when Emory is saying that it's proud of him and his work, and on behalf of our family, we're all proud of him too. Thank you, Herbert, and congratulations, Aaron. I know your family and friends are so proud of you in this award. E. Jackson Bedford, Jr. has served as a Superior Court judge in Fulton County since 1996. Outside the courtroom, the former trial lawyer and U.S. Navy aviator's soft spot for children led him to establish an annual program 
that ensures hundreds of deserving children receive a visit from Santa during the holidays. In 1993, Bedford, then president-elect of the Atlanta Bar Association, founded the Atlanta Santa Project, which arranges for visits from Santa and his elves to underprivileged and hospitalized children in the Atlanta area. Now co-sponsored by the Atlanta Bar Foundation, the event has grown each year. In 2010, more than 1,500 children were visited. Also every year, Christmas morning, Bedford and his wife, Patty, visit the oncology ward of the Children's Health Care of Atlanta at Eggleston Hospital as Santa and Mrs. Claus. Bedford has served on the board of directors of Brandon's Foundation, Inc., an organization assisting children suffering from childhood cancer and their families. He serves or has served on numerous other boards, including Community Cares, Inc., the Atlanta Humane Society, the Atlanta Bar Association, and the Atlanta Bar Foundation. Bedford graduated from high school in Oklahoma and earned a BA in International Affairs from the University of Virginia in 1966. Serving in the U.S. Navy from 1966 to 1970, he flew more than 100 combat support missions over Vietnam. After earning his JD, Bedford practiced trial law for 23 years before running successfully for the Fulton County bench. He was past president of the Atlanta Bar Association and the Atlanta Bar Foundation. He has received awards from both the Atlanta Bar and State Bar for excellence and professionalism. Bedford is also a recipient of the Chief Justice's Community Service Award. Additionally, the judge has been an adjunct professor of advanced litigation skills at Emory Law, where he is also a past president of the Alumni Association. It is our honor to present to you the Honorable T. Bed Jackson Bedford, the 2011 Distinguished Alumni Award. Honorable Dean, and if I can move your notes yes, over here a little bit, exactly. just sweep them aside. <laughs> and um, Honorable President Wells and distinguished uh, fellow recipients of this award and um, honored guests that are out here, um, my comments this evening, and first I would like to say that I am deeply honored, it goes without saying, um, to be a recipient of this um, award and especially to be recognized by this law school which has meant a lot to me in my uh, personal and my professional life. <laughs> my remarks uh, tonight with the theme is you never walk alone and what I want to share is that those of us that have achieved in life we don't get here by ourselves. It takes a lot of folks to assist us on our way. So when I was notified that I was receiving this uh, award, I asked, I said, well, ask Cassandra, I said, uh, who can I invite? And the answer was, well, invite your Rolodex. Well, apparently my Rolodex didn't show up. Uh, <laughs> but I was discussing it with Patty and I said to her, you know, who should we invite? Um, I don't want to just invite my Rolodex. And we decided that we should invite, and we both agreed that the people that should be here and that I really wanted to share this evening with me on this special occasion were those of you who have touched my life in some special way, be it family, which is down here, be it my professional uh, friends, my friends, that I socialize with, companions, teachers, and some of my teachers are here, mentors, actually all of those of you who have made a difference in my life. So I want all of you here tonight at my invitation to know that I could not and would not 
be standing here today being honored by this law school at Emory University without your support in some way. So I thank you and I am honored by your presence. Now as the theme of my remarks are that you never walk alone, <clears throat> I would ask that you indulge me, excuse me, <clears throat> in expressing specific thanks to certain people without whose influence and support I clearly would not be here. And this is not to eliminate anybody, but I certainly can't sit up here all night and go through my Rolodex and thank each and every one of you, so I want you to know I thank you ahead of time, but I would like to share with you um, the importance of certain people in my life. First, I want to thank my mother, who is down here, uh, Lucille Bedford, <coughs> and my father, who cannot be with us. My father's going on 94, mom turns 90 in three months, so I think she's done very well to be here. And it is their early influence who directed me to my love of country. And uh, you heard that I have served, and I've served proudly in the United States Navy. My father, who cannot be with us, was a career naval officer. And for a period of my life, I did follow in his footsteps. My mother instilled in me a love of learning, leading me ultimately to the University of Virginia, where I was exposed to intellectual stimulation and social awareness. Their influence has apparently worked as I am now, as you know, a Superior Court judge, and my brother John, who is sitting over here next to my mother, <coughs> is the Dean of Oklahoma City University School of American Dance and Arts Management. John and his wife, Jo Rowan, have been recognized both nationally and internationally for their contribution to musical theater and the revitalization of Broadway. They have also been inducted into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame for higher education. I think it would be fair for me to say that John and I are who we are in part because of our parents' influence. Now, as I was going into my senior year in Oklahoma City uh, in high school, my father was transferred to New Jersey. At that time in my life, a move would have been traumatic for me. And uh, as you can imagine, a senior in high school who's been there for four or five years. When my family and I were struggling with this impending transition, the mother and father of my childhood friend, Bob Baird, who is here with us tonight, and with his wife, Ann, also, invited me into their home. And so I could finish my senior year in Oklahoma City at the school that I had uh, matured through high school in. And Bob is like a brother to me, and his parents are my second set. Unfortunately, Reverend Baird is no longer with us, but I wish that he were because he has been a great um, influence on my life. And I am in part today who I am because of Bob and because of his family. So I thank you, Bob. Now, the years I spent in the Navy and some of the people who mentored and supported me along the way gave me the confidence to leave the Navy and come here to law school at Emory. And that's quite a step when you've kind of gotten comfortable in the military and you've got a job and you know your job. So that was a stretch and, and, and so I, I was uh, very uh, pleased that I was uh, given the confidence through my experiences to do that. And this is where I owe my thanks to Emory for accepting me as a student. Now, fortunately at that time, and I'm proud to say that I don't think Emory still puts people on the grid, they didn't grid people. And I applied. And if I'd been gridded on my grades alone, I wouldn't be here. I had reasonably good grades, but not what Emory would expect now. Instead, they looked at the person. And this is important for all of us. They looked at the person. And obviously, they must have seen in me attributes that they felt um, would ultimately, hopefully, um, put me in a place of success. And, and I thank Emory because I thank them for their choice and I thank them for their support and I thank them for their encouragement. The school is, and there are professors out here who were professors uh, when I was here. Um, of course, one of them, Nat Gazansky, told me if he had, if you had asked him back then if I would ever be acknowledged as being distinguished anything, he would have vehemently said no. <laughs> Nat, I ratted you out. Now, 
Harry Cashin is another person who has had an influence in my life, and he's seriously ill. I just learned from um, a call the other night, and uh, he was going to be here, and I'm greatly disappointed he uh, is not here. He gave me my first job out of law school, and this was when my application to his law firm was rejected by his other partners. And so, for some reason or other, he saw something in me that the rest of them didn't see. And he called me back, and this is a theme, because this is important that we consider people as individuals and not look at them just on uh, the surface. And he called me back in for an, uh, for an interview, and he hired me right there on the spot. Um, and I'm never going to forget what Harry told me. First, he said, you've been to law school and learned the law. Now I'm going to teach you to be a lawyer. And I thought that was, you know, important, and I didn't really know what it meant at the time, and I do, and I'm proud to say I know now. He then also told me I was a diamond in the rough, but he was going to polish me like a gemstone. Well, I took umbrage at this comment at the time because I thought it was an insult, but I later came to appreciate what he meant and am honored by his uh, commitment to me. He's been my friend and mentor for 40 years, and I would not be who I am and where I am today without Mr. Cashin's guidance and support. Now, for most of the time I practiced law, 20, I practiced law 23 years, I had two partners, Andy Kirshner, he passed away two years ago, and Tom Vinker, who is here tonight. As much as they grumbled and they complained and they made life hard for me in some uh, instances when I was uh, in active in the bar and becoming president of the bar, they actually ended up, they supported me in my Atlanta Bar Association activities and ultimately as my, uh, as the president of the Atlanta Bar. And again, without their support, I would not be where I am today. And as president of the Atlanta Bar Association, I was most fortunate and blessed to work with a lady by the name of Diane Osteen, who is over here. She was our executive director and remains our executive director. I could never have achieved the goals I had set for my presidency without her guidance and her support. Again, without Diane, I would not be where I am today. No thank you would be complete without recognizing another brother, and I hope he's gotten here. In spirit, my friend and mentor, Rob Wellen, and he is, was teaching a class. I think he's here. There he is. He's back there. It was Rob, who as president of the Atlanta Bar, assigned me the task of uh, starting and founding the sole practitioner small firm section, which those of you that know, um, that's where I really got started in the Atlanta Bar. And it opened leadership doors for me, both in the American Bar Association and the Atlanta Bar Association. And when I decided to run for judge the first time, it was Rob and his wife, Jan, who were there to support me. I still remember us sitting around the dining room table stuffing envelopes on Sunday afternoon in the middle of the beginning of a campaign. And as late as yesterday, Rob was on the phone strategizing for next year's campaign. Again, without Rob being willing to jump in and stand by me, I would not be who and where I am today. Now, I'd also like to recognize my staff, and there's a purpose for all of this, folks. Ellen Thomason, my judicial assistant, Tammy Gorman, my case manager, they're here, and Sandra Shin, my staff attorney, they tell me when and where to go and what to do. And without them, I would be nowhere. And Ellen is great, and I've commented this. Ellen tells me what to do, and she leaves me sticks notes on me as I'm leaving the office with directions. This says, Old War Horse, tomorrow night. That is an organization that I was recently president of, and the meeting is tomorrow night. So this is what keeps me straight. And again, I couldn't do it without them. Now, during my journey, my wife and companion of 32 years, Patty, she came into my life, and along with her came two daughters, Sean and Shannon, who could not be with us tonight, one for child care purposes. And although they're not daughters by blood, they are daughters of my heart. And I cannot begin to thank Patty enough for all she's meant to me and done for me. And without her love and backing, encouragement and support, I surely would not be who and where I am today. Thank you, Patty. I love you. In front of all these people. <laughs> now, finally, realizing the constraints of time, I want to recognize two other special people in my life, 
My grandson, Brandon, and he is, was the son of Shannon. Brandon is no longer with us. He died December 2nd, 1998 from childhood cancer. He was my hunting, fishing, and boating buddy, and Bob and their, his son, were they just were close in age. And Brandon was my love. Brandon opened up my heart to children, and specifically to children fighting disease and other challenges. I truly learned the resilience and the power of children confronting challenges like that. It is Brandon that Patty and I honor when we visit Eggleston Children's Hospital on Christmas morning, each Christmas morning. And last but not least, my grandson Bren, who has got school tomorrow, son of Sean, and he could not be here obviously because of school. Bren has taught me the joy and love that can be shared with a child each and every day. I have learned patience and generosity from Bren. I would not be who I am today without the love of these two beautiful, sweet boys. Now, thank you for indulging me on this journey of reflection. I have shared these friendships with you to remind all of us that we do not get where we are alone. Without love, friendship, and support of those special people we encounter in life, none of us being honored tonight would have achieved that which makes us distinguished alumni. So thank all of you. Thank you, Judge Bedford, and again, congratulations. I know the whole family must be very proud. I now invite our third honoree, Carl Mullis, from the class of 1975 to the stage, together with the dean. Uh-oh. <laughs> Carl Mullis graduated in 1972 from Yale University, and in 1975, he graduated with distinction from Emory Law. After graduation, Mullis joined the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice under its honors program. As senior attorney, trial attorney for the Antitrust Division for 11 years, Mullis conducted numerous grand jury investigations and criminal antitrust trials in five southern states. From 1986 until 2001, Mullis was a partner at Long Aldridge and Norman LLP, now McKenna Long and Aldridge, where he was head of the antitrust group. From 2001 until his retirement, he was of counsel at Paul Hastings, Janofsky and Walker LLP. In private practice, Mullis provided antitrust counseling and litigated antitrust cases for a number of Fortune 100 companies. He also litigated securities cases, class actions, and complex business disputes. During his career, Mullis handled appeals before U.S. Court of Appeals for the 2nd, 4th, 5th, and 11th circuits, and he was selected by Chambers USA as a leading lawyer in both antitrust and general commercial litigation. Mullis served as the chair of the antitrust section of the State Bar of Georgia and as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute of Continuing Legal Education in Georgia. He also served on the Emory Law School Council and on the Executive Committee of the Emory Law School Alumni Association. Since his graduation from law school, Mullis has been an avid student of and collector of American art. He was a guest curator of an exhibit on American prints at the High Museum of Art. The Carlos Museum and the Georgia Museum of Art have each had several exhibits of work from his collection. In recent years, Mullis has focused on collecting self-taught Southern art and has contributed to two books on the subject. Mullis serves as chair of the Board of Advisors of the Georgia Museum of Art. It is my honor to present to you, Carl, the 2011 Distinguished Alumni Award.
you know, this is one of the few occasions where I'm almost speechless. That's kind of hard to imagine, but it's, uh, it's uh, quite humbling. Um, and it's quite an honor. I want to thank you, Robert and Della and the alumni board. Um, this is kind of your, or my, it's a wonderful life moment. You know, that wonderful movie that you look at at uh, Christmas time. Um, and at the very end, when the whole communities gather around with uh, Jimmy Stewart, and um, it's kind of that moment here, uh, and it's much appreciated. I brought a friend. We'll talk about this friend in a little bit. Brought a face jug. Do you people know what a face jug is? It's a face jugs in a photograph that's up in the hallway. It was done on purpose for that way. Um, I want to especially, my wife's trembling, she hates those face jugs. <laughs> uh, I want to especially thank Babe for everything she's done for me. Um, she's been just more than I could ask for. When I was trying to determine today just what should I talk about, um, Helen's sister, I mean Babe's sister Helen was on the phone and she said, well, just get up there and tell them that you're the man you are today because of babe. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. You don't need to say anything more. Uh, and that's probably true. And I should just sit down right now, but I'm not going to do that. But it, it is very true. Um, you know, we've all been very blessed. Uh, I'm certainly blessed today and have been blessed. We had a grandson, our second grandson, this past Friday that our uh, son had. Um, and so um, I've been blessed with a great family, loved ones. But everyone in here has probably been blessed. Um, and you know, I believe that people that have been blessed like us, we all must have, we have an obligation to give back to the community, to give back to other people who haven't been as blessed. I've, I believe that this award that the Alumni Association gives is partly designed to inspire the Emory community, to inspire us to give back, that the right thing to do is for us to give back. And I think that's one of the emphasis on this award. And it's a great thing. You know, I've tried to give back, particularly in the arts, the area of the arts, but the other two honorees here today have really given back. And I'm just so honored to be here with them. Jackson Bedford has served this community as a, in a public position. He's made sacrifices to do that. You know, judges aren't paid very well. Judges have a lot of issues that we don't know about, that the normal populace don't, don't know about. And to have a great and intelligent and kind judge is just a remarkable gift to this community. It's a gift that Jackson gives to us. And we appreciate that. And if you've looked at Jackson today, you see his beard, his Santa beard. All right. He's getting ready to go to the hospital. And that's another way that Jackson gives to us. And we're so honored, Jackson. You know, I don't know Aaron, but I've read about him over the last month since these awards were announced. And it's nice and easy for us today to sit here and say, well, he did a great thing, you know, he honored civil rights, he fought the good battle. And that's true, and it's, a, but what we don't usually reflect on today, I mean, it's politically correct to say that. We're all for civil rights. In the 1960s here in the South, that was not the case. I grew up in a small southern town. I will tell you that someone that championed civil rights in a town like Savannah, a white person that did that, suffered severe social and financial detriment because of that. Not only did he suffer, but his family suffered. And we all owe a great deal to Aaron and his family for what they've done for us, what they've done for all of us. We'll never know what all the prices they paid, but I will assure you it was a dear one that they paid. 
Now, when I talk to people and I ask them, what should we talk about? What do I need to talk about here tonight? Well, I was told, well, talk about your Emory Law School experience. Talk a little bit about your practice. Okay, we'll do that quickly. I came to Emory Law School in 1972. I was the first, in the first class that was the first year students in this building. This was a brand new building the first year we came here. It was a great, great building. We uh, had a great class. There was 200 something students in that class. We had some great members of that class. Um, Ann Emanuel, Michael Suddeth, a number of other people were, um, Michael Sabbath, excuse me, were members of that class. Had some great friends with it. There were a lot of smart people in that class. Um, you know, as I think back about it, the best class that I had here at Emory Law School from 72 to 75 was a constitutional law seminar. It was a course where the students, I think there were like 10 of us in it, got to role play as members of the Supreme Court. We sat there, we had cases, we argued cases that were coming up to the Supreme Court. Then we decided we had to make the decisions on the cases of the Supreme Court. And that was really quite a remarkable experience because you began to understand the social, the political issues that go into making decisions that judges go through. It's not just the law. And it was a wonderful learning experience. Who was that professor that I had at that law school seminar? It was Nat Kazansky. You know, who's here? And that's one of the two professors here, current professors who were here in 1972. Nat and I became friends during law school, during that seminar. Uh, and that friendship has continued on for 40 some odd years. We've been best friends. Uh, and that's just a wonderful human being and a wonderful friend. You know, one thing that some of you don't know, and I guess I should probably tell the story is, that Nat introduced Babe and me. Nat set us up for a blind date. Um, kind of a tricky thing for him at the time, probably. <laughs> and I will, uh, I will um, on occasion, come up to Nat and say, Nat, you know, I'll never forget that you set Babe and me up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Babe on occasion will come up to Nat and say, Nat, I will never forget that you set Carl and me up. <laughs> and that's all that she will say. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, Nat was an associate dean here for I think 14, 15 years, and he personifies Emory Law School. Nat loves the students at Emory, they love him back. He thinks about the students and their welfare first and foremost. He focuses on what Emory can do to help the students. What can Emory do to help them make, make them better people, better students, better leaders, and better lawyers. He tries to instill in them a love for justice, truth, and honor to help them understand that they need to give back to the community and to do the right thing no matter how difficult it is. If you know Nat, then you know why Emory's a great law school. And if you know the many colleagues of Nat who also love their students, you know why Emory is going to be an even greater law school in the future. With respect to my legal career, you know, I had a great legal career. I did a lot of work with antitrust division. It was a lot of fun. You felt like you were doing the right things. I worked for two great firms, um, and we had a lot of great clients, some wonderful clients, as a matter of fact, and some wonderful cases. Probably the best way to personify the experience of being a litigator in a big law firm is to tell you a little bit about one of my partners, the guy that recruited me to come to Long Aldridge. That person was Jack Watson. Jack Watson was Jimmy Carter's chief of staff the last year that Jimmy Carter was in office. And Jack was the chairperson of the litigation section at Long Aldridge when I um, came there and he recruited me. Um, Jack was a gung-ho ex-Marine. He loved the Marine Corps. 
He would wear, I mean, this is the guy that, you know, dined with presidents and did everything. He wore a little, you know, a tie tack or a tie clip that was said Semper Fi. All right. He was just really, really gung ho. Brilliant, brilliant lawyer, Harvard Law School graduate. But from Jack's Marine days, he had three words that he learned. And those words were opportunity to excel. And if you're a Marine, I don't know if there's any ex-Marines in here, you know that an opportunity to, to, to excel is what they use as the words for when they're placed in an incredibly difficult situation, the most difficult situations, they view that as not a difficult thing, but that's an opportunity to excel. And Jack looked for and loved finding opportunities to excel. Now, you have no idea what it's like to work with a partner who's looking for opportunities to excel. <laughs> so that's what my legal career was, looking for opportunities to excel and dealing with those opportunities to excel. In addition to giving back to the community, I think it's very important for all of us to have some sort of passion, to have something that we're passionate about. You know, it can be Georgia football or bird watching or playing golf or collecting books. I don't care. But it needs to be something that you really love, really stimulates you because of passion stimulates us and makes the life more interesting. It makes the world a more enjoyable place. Over the years, I've developed a passion for art. It's something I've grown to love and to care about. In recent years, much to Babe's chagrin, I've developed a passion for southern pottery, these sorts of things, all right. Now, this is, I want to tell you a little bit about this. This is a face jug. It was done by John Metters, who was the brother of Lanier Metters, who was probably the most famous Georgia potter. It's an alkaline glaze on it, and alkaline pottery was first developed in Edgefield, South Carolina in the 1800s. It spread from Edgeville to Georgia to North Carolina, then to Alabama and Tennessee. And alkaline glazed pottery, along with jazz and the blues, is probably the few or one of the few true southern created art forms in this country. Uh, it doesn't have to be a face jug. They can be beautiful jugs with flowers or grape leaves on it. Um, but that whole alkaline tradition uh, is something that I've grown to love and care about. John made only about 130 of these jugs. So there's only 130 of these in the world. That's all that he made. So they're very rare and hard to find. And, you know, he took this, he took a handful of clay, a handful of clay, dirt, put it on a wheel, formed it put it in a kiln, took some wood, fired it up. That's what he created. You know, there's a simplicity and a beauty in that that we can all learn from. So that's, that's my passion. So much to babes. We had big debates about this. In the photo that's going to be on the wall of me, there is a picture of me holding this face jug, all right? It's the only face jug that's in the walls up there, you know, surprise, surprise. <laughs> But it was, done, it was done on purpose because I wanted Emory students and other people to know that I had a passion and what my passion was. And I wanted them to know that they should have a passion and that they should know that art is very important to us because the arts nurture our souls and they make us human in what we are today. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, for those very inspiring words and those kind words about the other honorees. Congratulations. It's been a privilege for me to represent our almost 10,000 alumni here tonight in honoring you. Even though you will now be on the wall for posterity, 
I know that your service to your community and especially our Emory Law School family will continue for years to come. As we conclude our program, I invite Dean Shapiro back to the podium for some final remarks. Uh, thank you, Della. I'd like to thank all of you for being with us here this evening to help us honor our distinguished alumni. I would like to thank our outstanding team at Development and Alumni Relations, uh, and especially our Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Cass Blackburn and Eric Blackwell, for all they did to make this evening possible. I'd also like to thank Corky Gallo, uh, who takes those wonderful portraits we got a chance to see up here on the screen this evening, and that uh, are on the walls there on the fifth floor. Now, it's been my great privilege to teach here for the past 15 years, and I walk by those portraits on the fifth floor every day, and they remind me and our students of the importance of the enterprise in which we're engaged. And as I teach my constitutional law class or my civil procedure class, which now involves looking out at a sea of the backs of laptop computers, I think that, I hope that some of those students out there may one day achieve some of those wonderful things uh, that the honorees on the wall have achieved. And this evening, it's been wonderful to be inspired once again by the outstanding accomplishments of our awardees. So please join me in honoring once more our Distinguished Alumni Award winners. Um, your excellence and your courage does always inspire us all. Now, please join us in the Hunter Atrium for a reception as we continue the celebration this evening. <laughs>